This is BBC News. I'm Chris Eakin. The headlines at six. Tributes are paid to the actor and comedian Mel Smith, star of Not the Nine O'Clock News. He's died of a heart attack at the age of 60. In the public prints, his image might have been of a sort of, you know, roistering rogue, but he was actually a very serious-minded guy, you know, thoughtful. Five people are jailed for manslaughter for their role in the sinking of the Costa Concordia last year. Fresh hopes for peace as Israeli and Palestinian officials agree to talks for the first time since 2010. Celebrations for Chris Froome, who is set to become Britain's second successive Tour de France champion. All the details in Sports Day at half six. Well, hello, very good evening. Welcome to BBC News. Tributes are being paid this evening to the comedian and actor Mel Smith. He's died at the age of 60 from a heart attack. He is best known for the sketch shows The Last Smith and Jones, starring alongside his comedy partner Griff Rhys Jones, and of course, not the nine o'clock news. Let's have a quick look at that classic BBC sketch show from the early 1980s. Can I put this into some sort of perspective? When I caught Gerald in 68, <clears throat> he was completely wild. Wild? I was absolutely livid. I, mean, was... I believe some folk can hear what Bugs Bunny is saying. And that Salt Lake City is a real nice place to stay in. I believe that JR really loves Sue Ellen. I believe that things sound better when you're yelling. And I believe that the devil is ready to repent. President. Well, tributes have been coming in for Mel Smith since the news broke this afternoon. Griff Reese Jones, who'd been friends with Mel Smith for 35 years, described him as a gentleman, a scholar, and a force for life. Stephen Fry, who was also an old friend, tweeted Mel lived a full life but was kind, funny, and wonderful to know. Rowan Atkinson, who of course worked with Smith on both Not the Nine O'Clock News and the film Bean, said he had a wonderfully generous and sympathetic presence both on and off screen. And the comedian and screenwriter Matt Lucas said, so sad to hear about the passing of the great Mel Smith, brilliant writer, actor and director and a lovely man too. Well, the BBC has also been paying tribute to Mel Smith. The director general Tony Hall has said, Mel Smith's contribution to British comedy cannot be overstated. And the BBC's director of television, Danny Cohen, said Mel Smith was one of the comedy greats of the modern era. He added, many of today's most celebrated comedians will have grown up learning from Mel Smith. Well, a little bit earlier, I spoke to John Lloyd, who's the creator of Not the Nine O'Clock News and a close friend of Mel Smith, and he told me of some of the fond memories he's had of times they spent together. It's very, very sad indeed, and, and of course shocking. And, uh, you know, people who loved Mel really loved him, and I was one of them. You know, I was very close to him, especially when we were younger, and he's a brilliant, brilliant talent and a wonderful guy. Wait, what was his talent. I mean, we, we, we've talked about uh, not the nine o'clock news and the last Smith and Jones, uh, but he did, he did much more than that. I mean, what was it about his talent? He was a, an incredibly gifted person across a whole polymathic range of abilities. I mean, not only was he a fantastic straight actor, could play tragedy and dangerous and also terribly funny. There are very few actors who can do that both equally well. There's a word which keeps cropping up in the tributes to him over the last couple of hours, and that is that he was a generous man. Uh, tell us about the person, about the individual. I know you knew him for a long time. Well, he was an incredibly generous person and a kind person, a great fun to be with, you know, convivial, um, funny, very intelligent, extremely well-read. You know, I suppose in the public prints, his image might have been of a sort of, you know, roistering rogue, but he was actually a very serious-minded guy, you know, thoughtful, sort of guy you could go to if you needed advice. 
And nobody has a bad word for Mel. Very few people, I don't think I can think of anybody who didn't like him. He could work with absolutely anybody, even very difficult people in other contexts. Everybody trusted him. And not only was he a great actor, he was a fantastic director, both of theatre and film. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's so many things one could say about him. He was just, it's a terrible loss. Did he enjoy his fame? Well, Mel, I don't think, really wanted to be an actor. I think uh, he would rather have directed actors, but people kept asking him because he was so good. But directing, I think, was really his first love, firstly in the theatre. And actor-writer as well, you know, in The Gambler, his show that he did with Bob Goody is quite simply one of the, a masterpiece of comic theatre. And another thing, perhaps, that people neglect to mention is his company, Talkback, that he started with Griff Rees Jones, in which Peter Fincham, who now runs ITV, brought to prominence, produced the most extraordinary efflorescence of talent. I mean, Ricky Gervais, Ali G, um, uh, Steve Coogan, Armando Iannucci, Chris Morris, Talkback made all these people. And it kind of invented modern, modern television, not only in comedy, but in drama, in reality shows like Grand Designs and bring poetry to television. And then, but amazingly, these guys bought Thames Television, a major company. And so they, we also owe to them the X Factor and Britain's Got Talent. So Mel was also an extraordinary businessman, apart from anything else. But how, how was that the case? I mean, it is so rare that you get somebody who's a great performer who then... I mean, they sold Talkback productions reputedly for 60 million pounds back in 2000. I mean, how do, how do you get one person who manages to be so successful in both camps? Well, I think we must put down probably the business success of Talk Back to Peter Fincham principally, but Griff is also very clever with that kind of thing. The main thing is vision, bravery, you know, a determination not to give in. That was the hallmark of Mel. Nothing was too much trouble. He would never say no to things. He always, he wouldn't let a problem ever get him down. It, that's what made him such terrific fun to be working with. Because if I, I'm somebody who tends to get very anxious and stressed about things, and Mel somehow was always calm, always, yeah, we can do that. It's, it, it, he, he just seemed to have a magnetic personality which made people think in his company anything was possible. And my goodness, it was. I mean, talk back, as you say, sold for 62 million. Quite an extraordinary thing. I mean, I wonder how much our younger viewers will know of Mel Smith, because, of course, he was involved in that business side, but he was, he was making a comeback to acting, had been for some time. Uh, I mean, is that... Why, why did he do that? Did he, did he miss it? I think he was having some difficulties with uh, film. It's very difficult to get films made. Uh, and Mel likes to be busy, so I think that if he was being offered acting work, he probably thought, for Demir, really. I think he would have rather been directing movies, but it was the one area really in his life, apart from Bean, of course, Bean the movie, which is, you know, one of the most successful comedy hits in the history of a British film. So we can't take that away from him. But some of his other things I don't think got the, the notice and the traction that he would have hoped. And, and I think once you've done a few films in Hollywood and they don't take you seriously because you haven't had a big hit, it's probably difficult going on knocking at that door. John Lloyd there, creator of Not the Nine O'Clock News. Now, coming up in a moment, we're joined by viewers on BBC One for a roundup of all the day's news. That's with Matthew and Rolla Walla. Family is what disappears when you're not looking at it. That's not a saying. I don't think that's a saying. Could we be related? I hope not. You know, I wanted to ask you, so the school you went to, was it like Hogwarts? I kind of made a commitment this evening to keep my clothes on. What are you, the traffic leprechaun or something? Did you just call me a leprechaun? Yes, I did. I called okay. you a leprechaun. I'm twice the height of a leprechaun. You... Family Tree, a brand new comedy by Christopher Guest, continues Tuesday at 10 on BBC Two and BBC Two HD. Welcome to the Royal Suite. It's £6,900 per night. Oh, that's it, I just wanted to say goodbye to her just in case. I might pop off, might yeah. not. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. By his purse, I know more or less what he wants. Bro, come on the bus, he started screaming and shouting, we're going to hell. I told him, you're not going to hell, we're going to Wilford. I'll we'll be happy. Life's very short. We're already passing through. Thank you very much. Please be nice tomorrow. Please be nice. Yes. 
Guys, how about a picnic tomorrow? Now, barbecue lunch or barbecue dinner? <laughs> dinner it is. Really feel like going to the beach this weekend. Yep, works for me. Can you wear shorts for a date? No, no need. Wherever you are and whatever you're planning, it's never been easier to stay one step ahead of the weather. Just download the BBC Weather app. Good evening. The comedian Mel Smith has dined at his home in London after suffering a heart attack. He was 60. Mel Smith rose to fame in the 1970s and 80s with Not the Nine O'Clock News and alas, Smith and Jones pioneering a new style of comedy. His fellow comedian Griff Reese Jones said he'd lost a very dear friend, describing him as a gentleman, a scholar, a gambler and a wit. Louisa Baldini looks back at his life. Oh yes, yes, yes. I mean, you can speak a few actual words. Of course, it was extremely difficult to get him even to this stage. Um... His repertoire of characters was diverse, and his comedic timing and talent were natural. Come in, me old mate, and have a cup of tea. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> John. It's quite ready to go first. Mel Smith will be remembered most oh, by the public start. for the larger-than-life characters he played Double. in television hits like Not the Nine O'Clock News and Alas, Smith & Jones, which lasted for 10 series over 16 years. He was a fantastic guy, very talented. You can see that from his work in all sorts of ways, actor, director, producer, business person, but more to the point, a very good friend uh, and a person that I've, I don't think I've ever met anyone who didn't like Mel. Mel Smith had set up Talkback Productions with Griff Rees Jones, which they sold for a reputed £60 million in 2000. He also turned his hand to directing films like Bean with his old friend Rowan Atkinson. But he suffered from health problems, including a seven-year addiction to painkillers, taking 50 a day. In 2008, when he appeared on Celebrity Mastermind, viewers were shocked at his speech and demeanour. Uh, the Teenage Cancer Trust. And your chosen subject? Shakespeare's comedies. A few years ago, for a documentary, Mel Smith reminisced about his time as an actor. I know that looking back now, if I watch an old sketch or a bunch of old sketches, I know that I think it's a very, very good programme, which is something one should be very careful about, about thinking. But I, 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 I think it was brilliant. You know, we all have our moment in the sun, I think. Mel Smith, who's died at the age of 60. Five prison officers have been suspended while police investigate an alleged assault on one of the men charged with a Woolwich murder. Michael Adelbalajo, who's accused of killing Fusilier Lee Rigby in May, is said to have been injured while being restrained. Jane Peel reports from Belmarsh Prison in South London. Exactly what happened inside one of the country's highest security jails isn't clear, but the result is that five prison officers have been suspended. On Wednesday, Michael Adabalajo had to be treated in Belmarsh Prison's medical centre after apparently losing two teeth. The Metropolitan Police is investigating a complaint of assault. No one's been arrested, but five prison officers here have been suspended. Michael Adabalajo is always accompanied by five officers whenever he's out of his cell. The union representing the suspended staff says they were using approved techniques to restrain the prisoner. It's an unfortunate incident where a prisoner has been injured, high profile prison nonetheless, but we're confident that our five members involved in this incident will be completely exonerated of any wrongdoing when the investigations are complete. 
The prison service won't comment on what happened. It says it's inappropriate while the investigation's going on. It's thought the police will want to study CCTV footage from inside the jail as part of that investigation. Drummer Lee Rigby died close to Woolwich Barracks, just a few miles from the prison where both Michael Adebalajo and a second suspect, Michael Adebawali, are being held. They're both due to go on trial in November, accused of the soldier's murder. Jane Peel, BBC News, at Belmarsh Prison. A court in Italy has convicted five men of manslaughter in connection with last year's sinking of the Costa Concordia cruise liner. 32 people died when the ship ran aground off the Italian coast. The five employees all received prison sentences, though it's not clear if any of them will spend time in jail. From Rome, Alan Johnston. Where she came to rest, the Concordia stricken on the rocks, a calm enough scene but the night of the disaster had been very different. A story of terrifying chaos in the darkness. Each tiny figure down there is a passenger desperately trying to reach a lifeboat. And around them, in the freezing sea, others are drowning. More than 30 died. In this court, four of the crew and a cruise company manager were convicted today of manslaughter and negligence but they had plea bargained and got short prison sentences, all less than three years, and it's unlikely that any of them will actually serve time. Some are obviously disappointed by this leniency. We can't say we're satisfied because there are victims, but we can say that it's the first step to find the truth. As the courtroom drama unfolds, the focus now is very much on the man who was in command of the ship that night. Captain Francesco Scatino. Blamed not just for the disaster, but also for abandoning ship before many of his passengers. Italians see him as a cowardly national disgrace. He's been tried separately and faces multiple manslaughter charges. The captain insists that he's committed no crime, that what happened was an accident. But if he's convicted, he could face 20 years in jail. Alan Johnston, BBC News, Rome. Israel has agreed to release what it calls a limited number of Palestinian prisoners as the two sides prepare to hold direct peace talks for the first time in three years. The American Secretary of State, John Kerry, has said he hopes negotiators would arrive in Washington in the next week or so. From Jerusalem, Quentin Somerville has sent this report. It was a last-minute diplomatic dash by John Kerry that finally delivered progress on peace talks. Today, the first concrete details emerged. Israel will release Palestinian prisoners, including some who have been held in Israeli jails for decades, a gesture to help talks get started. But among Palestinian politicians, there's scepticism. They do not want another peace process that is a substitute to peace. Palestinians want real negotiations, want a real outcome want real peace. Both sides remain far apart on a number of issues. Previous talks were derailed by the issue of Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank. There's no agreement on where the borders between the two states should lie. And the future of Palestinian refugees also remains in dispute. But perhaps one of the most contentious areas lies here, Jerusalem. Both sides claim it as their capital, and for each, it has deep historical, religious and cultural significance. Any negotiations on the city's future may have to be put to one side for now, so that progress can be made in other areas. It's five years since Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas sat together for short-lived peace talks in Washington. For now, it will only be their representatives at the table. Getting the two leaders face to face again is a far off prospect. What matters for now is keeping both sides talking. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Jerusalem. Cricket and Australia will have to set a new batting record if they're to avoid defeat against England in the second Ashes Test. They trail by more than 550 runs with two days' play remaining. Our correspondent Joe Wilson reports now from Lords. There is a manicured madness at the heart of Lords. When you look closely, you can see this palace of cricket was built on a slope. Saturday for England was as straight and true as Joe Root's bat. Promoted to the top of the order for the Ashes, proving himself. By three o'clock, England were 370 ahead. 
Bresnan had gone, but Bell was in, grasped just above the sloping turf by Steve Smith, or at least the fielder thought so. TV umpire looked and decided his fingers were not quite underneath the ball, not out. Just another bruise to Australian morale. Well, Roots 100 came just after tea, came off 247 balls. Old-fashioned diligence from England's youngest player. Ian Bell guided himself to another 50 and all Australia could do was watch England's lead go past 500. Well, if you're here as a supporter, at least you can choose to leave, but Australia's players are now tied to a test match they surely can't win. What's left for them is a huge test of spirit as much as cricket. Joe Wilson, BBC News, Lords. Britain's Chris Froome has all but secured victory in the Tour de France. He finished third in today's 20th stage and will take a virtually unassailable lead of more than five minutes into Paris on the final day of the race tomorrow. His victory would mean consecutive British wins after Sir Bradley Wiggins' success last year. Golf and Lee Westwood has the lead at the Open at Muirfield. The Englishman has never won a major title but is well placed on the third day's play. He's one shot ahead of the world number one Tiger Woods at the top of the leaderboard. Well, that's it from the BBC Newsroom. We're back with the late news at half past ten. Now it's time for the news where you are. Bye-bye for now.